Well, let's uh, begin by reading our text, and I'm just going to read the portion we're going to look at <clears throat> this evening. We're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. Matthew 6, 7 through 15. Uh, Jesus says this, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now again, just by way of reminder, this morning we were looking at uh, that kind of service that Jesus calls us to give the Father. We were looking at the way that he calls us to do it so that it will be acceptable to him. And he also told us the difference that it will make. Jesus, remember, wants us to, to give to the poor. He wants us to have a heart of compassion uh, towards those who are needy, even as his Father also does. And, of course, we've seen how our Lord Jesus does as well. He wants us to pray and ask the Father for the things that he has promised to give us, things that we need, so that his kingdom may continue to move forward. We're actually going to look more at that this evening. And he wants us to fast, to humble ourselves and to seek him in an even more intense way by withdrawing from the world and from even our necessary food for a time. And usually fasts in the Bible lasted for a day, although we know that they've lasted as long as, as 80 days, but um, the Lord is not recommending that we do that. But certainly uh, for a day when the situation requires it. Now Jesus told us that if we were to do these things in an acceptable way, we do have to do them with the right motive. We need to do them for the Father's honor and not for our own. The scribes and the Pharisees, remember, liked to parade their piety in public so that the rank and file Jew would admire and respect them. Uh, we've noted also there's a lot of the same thing that's actually going on today. Uh, we need to guard ourselves against that. Jesus says we need to be willing to put ourselves aside to forget ourselves and any hope we have of impressing others and to do these things secretly so that only the Father can see them. And Jesus also told his wife, if we do these things for the Father's honor, he will repay us for whatever we do in his name for the poor. He will answer our prayers and especially when we fast. If we do these things for men to be seen and honored by them and we receive that honor or that applause, then that's really all that we're going uh, to get. Uh, I, as I was saying this, I remembered one occasion years ago in a, uh, a Pentecostal church where somebody uh, basically said the Lord told him that there were so many people that were present that evening that were going to give a thousand dollars each to his ministry. And as, each, as he said, you know, raise your hand if the, if the Lord or if the Spirit is moving you. With each hand that went up, there was this huge round of applause. And I remember even on that occasion thinking about this particular passage. If you do it to be seen of men, you've received your reward in full. So what they got for that was a round of applause. And that was it. And actually, looking back at it now, it was a very poor investment because of the, uh, the ministry that they were actually supporting. But if we want the blessing that the Lord has to give us, we have to do it the way that he has told us to do it, and the way that Jesus tells us. And actually, this is what we will do because that's what the Spirit of God will move us uh, to do. But now again, Jesus tells us more here. 
He gives us not only general instruction on prayer as well as fasting and uh, giving of alms, but on how we are to pray in particular in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And by the way, I think you've probably heard before that this prayer might more rightly be called the disciples' prayer rather than the Lord's Prayer because Jesus was teaching it to his disciples. In a parallel passage, I believe in Luke, it was given to the disciples in answer to their request of Jesus, teach us to pray, even as John taught his disciples to pray. Jesus gave this prayer in response to that. And of course, the Lord Jesus is also teaching us uh, this prayer this evening to guide us in how we might best pray. So he again does this by way of contrast, telling us first how not to pray and then showing us uh, the proper way of prayer. So first of all, let's consider what Jesus tells us not to do. He says, first of all, in verses 7 through 8, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, first of all, Jesus says we are not to pray like the Gentiles. And, of course, what he means here are not converted Gentiles, not God-fearing Gentiles, but he's talking about the nations that do not know the true God, the, 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 the people that are praying to foreign gods. By the way, when Jesus says, so then do not be like them, we could actually expand that to virtually everything that the unbeliever does. Uh, there's many things they do that we do not want to imitate because they march to the sound of a different drummer. They're a part of a different kingdom. They have a different kind of heart, a heart that is steeled in enmity against God. They're going to do a lot of things we shouldn't do. Now, Jesus, though, points us to one thing in particular that they were doing that we should avoid when it comes to prayer, and that is their meaningless repetition. Now, this phrase in the Greek really is just one word, and this word can actually have two different meanings. It can mean to say many words, to speak for a long time, to be repetitive, or it can mean to speak with words that have no meaning, which would mean then uh, to, to babble. Uh, okay. But it can also mean both. It can mean to speak many meaningless words or to just kind of go on and on babbling. And if you'll notice that that's essentially what the translators favor here, meaningless repetition. The Gentiles thought if they just said enough, if they bombarded their deity long enough that he would eventually do what it was they were asking. I say he, it could be she. There were also female deities. Now, apparently, what they said didn't even necessarily have to make any sense. Meaningless repetition. Jesus says we need to avoid that when it comes to prayer. Uh, by the way, we should um, also be careful that we don't fall into just sort of a rote pattern of praying. Maybe sometimes we should listen to ourselves. I try to listen to myself when I pray. I want to make sure I'm not saying the same things over and over again. Sometimes we can just kind of kick in neutral and do that. But we really need to be thinking through what we're praying. But when we think about meaningless repetition and we think about what's going on around us today, as I was thinking about it, two modern examples came to mind from what Jesus is actually saying here. And by the way, these, by using these particular examples, I just want you to know that I'm not trying to be unkind to the people who are actually doing these things. There was a time when I was actually doing one of these, and perhaps there was a time when you were doing uh, one of these things. But I just really want to point out that what they're doing is not what Jesus wants us to do. And those two practices would be the Roman Catholic practice of praying the rosary and the Pentecostal charismatic practice of, of praying in tongues. I think Jesus is actually addressing both of these things in this text. Now, Roman Catholicism teaches that by praying the rosary, and what that means is by saying so many Hail Marys, 
okay, which is the greeting that Gabriel gave to Mary when he came to announce that she would bear the Messiah. And by the way, when you say Hail Mary in the rosary, you're essentially invoking Mary to pray on your behalf. So by doing that and by repeating so many Our Fathers, which essentially is praying the Lord's Prayer, along with reciting the Apostles' Creed and the Gloria Patri, there are certain things they believe that God will actually give you. Uh, for instance, and by the way, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but God will bless you. He will bless your home. He will convert unbelievers to the Catholic faith. He will accept that sacrifice of praying through the rosary as part of the satisfaction that you owe in penance. Remember, we talked about that when we looked at the Reformation uh, this past uh, October. Whenever uh, you confess your sins, the priest will give you penance that you need to do to make satisfaction for your sins. And some of those things may be praying through the rosary so many times. Or by praying the rosary, you can also help those who are in purgatory uh, get out more quickly. And certainly, if you love someone, you, you may actually want to do that. As I was looking at the website uh, that was uh, describing the rosary, because I needed a bit of a brushing up on the subject myself, there was a picture of, of these priests that were holding these rosaries, and they were walking out into a cemetery, and there was a priest in, in front of these different headstones praying the rosary. And I can only assume from that that they were trying to help those particular departed souls get out of purgatory. Well, they believe there's many other blessings that you can obtain by praying the rosary. But the problem with this is that there's nothing in Scripture that would lead us to believe that we can gain God's blessing by doing these things, by praying in this way. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us that Mary can even hear what we're praying or that any of the saints that are in heaven can hear or that they can do anything to help us even by way of prayer. Jesus specifically tells us here that we should not be long-winded or repetitious when we pray. And I think you know as well as I do, when you, when you pray something enough times, when you use this kind of repetition, there's really no way of avoiding losing the sense even of what you're saying. It becomes really meaningless to you, as well as, as our, Jesus tells us, meaningless to the Lord. Even if you are praying a biblical prayer, just to repeat it over and over again would not be uh, what the Lord has us to do. It's not quantity that matters here, but quality, I think, that matters. Lifting up our hearts and our souls to the Lord for the things that we know will give glory and honor to Him. Jesus actually tells us, let our words be few. Now, the second example is that modern-day use uh, or that modern-day practice of speaking in tongues that also involves speaking many words, but this time these words are literally meaningless with a great deal of repetition. Now, the word tongues uh, in the Greek, I think you should know by now, is not referring to babbling. It's not necessarily referring to angelic language, but it literally means language. It just simply means speaking in different languages not in meaningless phrases, not in babbling, but in actual words of a different language, a language other than the one that you have actually learned, but it's still an earthly language. Remember on the day of Pentecost when they were speaking in tongues? The people that were gathered around the Jews who were there for the Feast of Pentecost heard them speaking of the glorious works of God in their own languages. They could understand what they were saying. It was not babbling. But if you've ever had the chance to listen to people speaking in tongues today, uh, which I've, I've had the, um, uh, at least the opportunity to do so, uh, I was in a Pentecostal church for several years. I was formerly a member of a charismatic church and an assistant pastor of a church that was very charismatic, where the pastor and the youth pastor were continually praying in tongues. I had a chance to sort of hear a lot of these, you know, folks doing this. And if you had that opportunity, you would quickly see that what they're doing is really nothing more than babbling. They're just repeating certain phrases that have no meaning over and over again, 
thinking that somehow they're praying in the Spirit to the Lord, that the Lord is going to interpret this to be something significant and special, and they seem to derive some sort of benefit from it. I have to admit that there was a time when, uh, very early on, when I thought that, that I had that gift, and as I tried to use it, I listened to myself talk, tried to figure out if this could be a language, but concluded it was just babbling, and didn't really gain any benefit from it uh, myself. Now, on one at one occasion, one of the professors at the college that Don and I went to was relating a story where a friend of his went to a charismatic meeting. Um, he, he pretended he was speaking in tongues, but what he did was he quoted John 1.1 1, 1 in Greek. Now, actually, he was speaking in tongues. It was, a, it was an actual language. It was a language other than the one that he would normally speak. But the people around him did not understand what, what he was saying, nor did they recognize it as John 1.1. 1, 1. So they prayed for an interpretation. And somebody did get up and interpret it, but it was nothing like what it actually said. It was essentially what the pastor believed the Spirit of God was saying through those particular words. Now, again, I don't want to be harsh. I don't want to be unloving in, in pointing you know, these things out. But we do need to see that Jesus is addressing uh, these practices here. And he's telling us this is not what he wants us to do. Rather than using meaningless words, our words should be full of meaning. Uh, rather than praying for a long time, Jesus says that we should speak sparingly because the Father already knows what it is that we need even before we ask. So the question then is, how should we pray? Well, that's what the Lord's Prayer is actually all about. And I want you to note here that the Lord's Prayer is relatively short. It certainly isn't repetitious, and it's not meaningless. Now, this prayer can be broken down into three sections, and these should be the three movements, as it were, in our prayers. And I think we'll find that perhaps as we compare the way we pray to the way Jesus tells us we should pray, that maybe our prayers don't exactly line up with this, which means that we ought to try to bring it to conform with what Jesus is actually telling us here. Now, the three movements are basically these, prayer for God's glory and his kingdom. Secondly, prayer for our needs. And then thirdly, arguments as to why the Lord should hear us and answer us. Now, Jesus here is not telling us that we need to pray these specific words, although we also have to admit we certainly may do that, as long as we don't believe that by continually repeating them or chanting them like some kind of a magic mantra that the Lord is somehow going to do something special for us because we've said it X number of times. That's not what this prayer is for. Rather, we need to use it as a pattern for our prayers. So what is it that Jesus teaches us here? Well, first of all, he tells us that when we pray, we need to make God's glory and his kingdom our priority before we come to him with our needs. And I think sometimes we fall into the pattern of just simply coming with our needs and skipping everything else that we should be praying for. But we do need to understand that he promises to meet our needs for a particular reason and when we are doing particular things. First of all, Jesus says in verses 9 through 10, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now notice first of all that Jesus teaches us that we in our relationship with him may address God as our Father. And Ferguson, when we were going through that study on the Sermon on the Mount, pointed out something very interesting. And that is that the number of times that the word Father occurs in chapter 6, and particularly in the sections that we're, we're looking at right now, what our Father uh, wants us to do, what he sees in secrets and so forth, Ferguson pointed out that the number of times that the word Father is used here to refer to our relationship with him is more than... than all the times it occurs in the Old Testament put together, which means that, that we're seeing a new revelation here of our relationship with God that was not quite as clear in the Old Testament. It reminds us that now that we have received Jesus and trusted him as our Lord and Savior, 
that we've been adopted into the family of God. Jesus wants us to know that his father is now our father and that we have a right to come to him and to ask him for these things in the name of his son Jesus because we belong to him. So it's, first of all, expressing a tremendous privilege that we have that the world does not have. God is our Father. We may ask Him for these things. Secondly, we should notice the use of the plural personal pronoun, our. Uh, We looked this morning at the fact that Jesus tells us that when we pray, we should pray secretly and not ostentatiously so that others see us and honor us for our piety. Uh, This reminds us that there are times when we can actually pray together because you really can't say our Father when you're by yourself. Jesus wants us to pray corporately. So there are times when we are to get together and pray together, such as what we're doing tonight as we've gathered together for worship, but also when we gather together on other occasions, such as on uh, Wednesdays when we meet together for study and for prayer, or uh, in the mornings when we meet together at uh, 9.30, and here's a, here's a plug for that particular prayer meeting, uh, to pray for the services and to pray for whatever burdens might be on our hearts at that time. But now notice the burden of our prayer, where it's first of all to lie, and that is for the, with regard to the Father's glory. Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first thing that we are to pray is that, uh, was basically asking the Father to make it so that his name would be regarded as holy throughout the entirety of the world, that he would be regarded as holy. Because remember, a name is simply a designation or a label for a person. If I talk about Henry or Dick, I'm not just talking about a name, I'm talking about a person. And when God says, or Jesus says, we should pray that the Father's name would be hallowed, we're praying that he would be hallowed or treated as holy. That everyone everywhere, including ourselves, would recognize him as God, as the only true God, and would honor him as God by acknowledging him, owning him, obeying him, turning from false gods to worship him, and by depending on him for everything we need. The one you depend on is basically your your God. You need to be careful whom you depend on. But we need to know that our absolute dependence is on God. Now, for this actually to take place, the next two petitions must also be fulfilled for the Father's name to be reverenced in this way, for Him to be reverenced. His kingdom needs to come. Verse 10, your kingdom come and His will needs to be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will is that everyone treat Him as God, obey Him, honor Him, and so forth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what Jesus is telling us to do here is to pray that the kingdom that Jesus brought, the kingdom that he brought with him into the world as, as the king, he's the king presenting himself, and he, when he first came, he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the king is present. This kingdom that he came to establish, we are to pray that it would continue to expand and to grow until it fills the world, and that as it does... It would overthrow that kingdom which also exists in the world, which is the kingdom of Satan. That his captives would be freed from his power and that they would be given the power to obey him even as the angels and the saints obey him in heaven. Essentially, Jesus is telling us here that we should pray that the Lord would bless that work of evangelism and missions that he entrusted to his church which we call the Great Commission. Because remember what the Great Commission is, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. How is that different than what Jesus is teaching us to pray here? To pray that that work would actually be completed. Now we do need to understand that that work is why the Lord saved us. He saved us that we might be a part of that kingdom. He saved us so that we might be workers in that kingdom, laborers, as it were, in that vineyard. That's the reason why we're here and we're not in heaven. Why, when the Lord converts somebody, they don't just immediately, as it were, get singularly uh, singularly raptured into heaven. 
because he wants us to remain here to do this particular work, to work on moving this commission uh, forward. And so we are to pray that the Lord would do that. And by the way, when we pray for that, we also need to include ourselves in that prayer, that the Lord would use us to move those things forward, that we would reverence him and treat him as God, that we would, uh, again, do the work that's necessary to bring his kingdom uh, more fully into the world, and that we also would obey him as the angels and the saints do in heaven. Now, after we prayed for this, Jesus tells us that we may next ask the Father to take care of our own needs. And now think about what Jesus actually, um, I think, will tell us in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, as a matter of fact, it comes um, later in this chapter where he tells us not to worry about, you know, where our food's going to come from, where our clothing's going to come from, but rather seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Well, this is exactly what Jesus is teaching us in this prayer, isn't it? Seek first his kingdom. That's what the burden of the first part of the prayer is, to seek first his kingdom and the extension of his kingdom and his glory and his honor. And if we do that, then he will take care of our needs. So Jesus tells us, pray first for this. And then after you've prayed for this, pray that the Lord will take care of your needs. Now, the first petition is that he would give us each day what it is we need. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And I want you to notice here this too. Notice that he teaches us to focus on each day, on the present, and not to worry about what's coming down the road, about the future. If we have what we need for today, we have everything that we should be concerned about. Remember, each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. And Jesus says, if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, he will take care of your needs. You don't need to worry. That's not the way we live. We live always concerned about what's going to happen the next day and the next day. We want to make sure that we have what we need, not only for the next day, but for a long ways down the road. But Jesus says, just be concerned about this day. Give us this day our our daily bread. That's living, of course, by faith. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have possessions. We know the Bible says we can have possessions, but we need to learn not to worry, but to trust the Lord. He said that he will take care of our needs. If we trust him, we need to believe that he will and trust him uh, for those things. Now, we are to pray then after that, and by the way, our daily bread would include everything that we need, uh, food and clothing, as well as health and strength. We are to pray next that he would forgive our sins. And remember that even though trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of our sins are actually forgiven past, present, and future. The Lord still wants us to be confessing our sins, as we're reminded in 1 John. And as we're confessing our sins, he is faithful and just to be cleansing us of our sins. One of the marks that we are believers is that we will be confessing our sins to the Lord when we, we sin, when we become aware of them. And we'll also be asking the Lord to forgive us for those that we aren't aware of. But here, Jesus is telling us that when we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, that we, are, we should pray that the Lord, the Father, would forgive us in a particular way, in the same way that we actually forgive others. He says in verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, which means in the same way or with the assumption that we already have forgiven them. And then Jesus expands on this in verses 14 through 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Now, I know I, you know I've said this numerous times, but I'll say it again just so we don't misunderstand. Jesus is not telling us that God's forgiveness is based on our forgiving others. If you forgive others, I will then forgive you. But rather that we can know that our sins are actually forgiven when we find within ourselves the power to forgive others. Forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. This um, interpretation is also reflected in Westminster Shorter Catechism 
where we read in question and answer 105, what do we pray for in the fifth petition? And the answer is in the fifth petition, which is, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, we pray that God, for Christ's sake, would freely pardon all our sins, which we are the rather encouraged to ask because by His grace, we are enabled from the heart to forgive others. One of the ways we can know that we are forgiven is because we have the power to forgive those who have also sinned against us. The Bible has quite a bit to say about that. Jesus has quite a bit to say about that. It's not optional to forgive others. We need to have a gracious and a merciful heart towards even our enemies, really. Now, finally, we are to pray that the Lord would strengthen us spiritually so that we wouldn't need additional work by the Father to that end. And I believe that's what he has in mind in verse 13 where he says this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, I know we don't often think about God doing this, but Jesus actually tells us to pray that the Father wouldn't do this. So this is something he actually does. God sometimes leads us into temptation. Now, he doesn't tempt us. We know that from Scripture. He doesn't uh, well, he, he's not going, he doesn't want us to commit that evil, but sometimes he will expose us to various temptations in order to help us. And what is it he's going to expose us to? Well, the very things that we're most liable to, right? That's what we're going to be confronted with so that we will learn by his grace to overcome it. Remember that trials and temptations are certainly trials are meant to purify and they are meant to strengthen us. Now here, Jesus teaches us to pray that the Father wouldn't lead us into temptation, that he wouldn't take us in that direction. So what are we actually asking for here? I think perhaps we're asking that the Lord would strengthen us, that perhaps we would seek him with, with the kind of zeal that we need to be seeking him and seeking to strengthen those areas where we're weak so that the Lord won't have to subject us to those things in order to make us stronger in those areas. We need to confront our, our sins, our, our liabilities, our weaknesses, and strengthen them. And if we don't, the Lord is, is very faithful and he's very gracious to help us do that very thing by making us confront those things. But we're also praying that if in God's providence this is necessary, that he would also use those things to strengthen us and purify us and that he would quickly deliver us from them as well as from all evil. Now, whether this means the devil, the evil one, or whether it means just evil in general, it, perhaps it doesn't matter. I think we should take it uh, in, in a general sense to deliver us from all evil, our own evil, the, the sin of our own hearts, uh, the evils that uh, we may be falling into, being tempted by, and certainly deliverance from the evil one, which he has accomplished in Jesus. But sometimes we have to confront because of the Lord's work in our lives. Well, Jesus then ends this prayer by showing us that we should also add arguments or reasons why the Father should actually hear and answer these prayers, arguments are things that maybe we don't use as much as we should, but we often find them in Scripture. Uh, you should do these things, Lord, because you're gracious, because you're merciful, because your servant trusts in you. The Psalms are just full of reasons why the Lord should answer our prayers. But here, Jesus gives us three reasons or three arguments that we can use of why God should answer this prayer. He should answer it, first of all, because, he says, yours is the kingdom. You see, God or the Father has a personal interest in the growth of this kingdom. He made a promise to his son that he would subdue all of his enemies under his feet. These are the things that must take place if this is to happen. So essentially, all the things that we're praying must be prayed for the kingdom to advance. Not only those particular prayers regarding the kingdom, but even those prayers for the things we need. Because if we don't have what we need, we're not going to be able to do what we need to do in order to move the kingdom forward. So the Father should answer these prayers because 
they're all aimed at the very thing that, that he is doing in this world, which is extending the kingdom of his son. Now, secondly, Jesus says that we should pray that he would do these things because uh, his is the power. He really alone has the power to do these things. And it honors the Father when we recognize that, that there is nobody else that we can look to. There's no one else who can help but the Father alone. That's what it means that, that he is God. We depend upon him. So we, we're asking him because we're recognizing that only the Father can do the things that we're actually asking him to do. And then finally, our last argument is he should do these things because Jesus says, yours is the glory. Because he alone deserves the glory and by answering these prayers, he will be glorified. We do need to remember that everything that God has made, he has made for one specific reason, and that is his glory. You know, many churches today teach and believe, and I certainly did at one time as well, that God created all these things because somehow he had to, and that he takes care of us because he must do that. And everything that he does is essentially for us, it makes God basically the servant, and we become almost the masters. But the Bible has actually a different take on this. God didn't create all these things for us. He created all these things for himself. And everything he does for us and everything he does in this world has really that end, that same end in mind, his glory. That's actually what Paul writes and what he means when he writes in Romans eleven thirty six. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. God created the world. He created everything in it. And things are happening as he desires them to happen for one purpose only. And that is that he may bring glory to his name. The reason why he sent his son into the world was to glorify his grace and his mercy. And I hope we all see that um, more clearly as we've experienced it ourselves. When we see what it is we deserve. And what it is that the Lord has given to us. God does what he does to bring attention to himself and to reveal himself to us. And so why should he answer these requests? Again, because they will all do exactly that. Bring him glory and bring him honor. The honor that he desires by extending the kingdom of his son. So the point behind all this is essentially this. Rather than continually repeating creeds or greetings, prayers or doxologies, or babbling meaningless phrases. The Lord would have us to focus on particular things when we pray. His glory and his kingdom and our ability actually to serve him in that kingdom. That's what this prayer is really all about. So may the Lord help us to be able to utilize this prayer and to shape our prayers around this prayer so that his goals will be reached and his purposes will be fulfilled. And let's not forget that as those things actually take place, he is glorified, but we also benefit from all of those things. The reason why we have the things that we have that God has promised to us and we have such a glorious future in the heavens is because God has a plan to glorify his name in giving these things to us. So we actually do benefit. That's where the benefit comes from to us. But let's not forget the main burden of our hearts needs to be set on seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. So may the Lord help us to do that. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to be able to apply what it is we've uh, been taught by our Lord Jesus this evening.